this is going to be something just a tad different for my channel today. Well, I let my latest community poll pick what video you guys want next. I dug into the archives and picked one of the scripts that I wanted to get through. So I'm going to look at the F-35 and if it deserves the shade that's thrown at it. So grab your G-harness, strap in, and let's take a flight, shall we? So, the F-35. A fighter myself I have heaped loads of scorn on. In podcasts, I'm on my older content. Here's the thing that comes with age. Wisdom and the ability to see things from a different new perspective. You know, one of those things that's supposed to make the internet great? So, utilizing this fantastic tool, I hopped back onto the internet to see if in fact I was wrong. You know what I found out? That no matter what any opinion anyone has in the F-35, they're all apparently wrong. You're either a troll, a pro-American freedom thumper, or a pro-Kremlin gremlin. Now, not exactly the most encouraging start to my research for this video. So, using what I hope is some basic bitch common sense, I looked at the information from both sides of the argument, looking at the sources of these reports, and then come to see if it comports with what reality actually shows us. I may ramble from time to time in this video, but it's kind of a deeply complex subject, and out of deference to my own rapidly deteriorating brain cells, I'm going to try and keep this kind of simple, so I don't stutter too much. But I'm going to put some chapters in here so you can bounce back and forth if you so desire. Now, I am sure most of you are familiar with the drunken Scottish YouTube legend that is Laserpig. Out of deference, I may paraphrase him a few times throughout this video. And because I believe in giving credit where credit is due, Laser Pig's video is what set me down this path. I'll attempt to make my points as simple as possible as not to make myself sound like a four-legged internet drunkard. However, unlike that curvaceous pink pig, I've got no head for wine or alcohol, period. But I took a butt ton of edibles because that shit is legal here. So anyways, on with my apology tour. Now, was I wrong about the F-35? Short answer, yes. Long answer, also yes, but thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Now, all joking aside for a few seconds, yes, I was very, very wrong about the F-35. Now, I hear some people asking me what the hell makes me qualified to talk about the F-35. I'm a filthy tanker, after all. Well, I'll tell you what qualifies me. It's my channel, for starters. But I do have a background in history in aircraft maintenance and repair. Granted, this was civilian side of things, which is the equivalent to learning to shoot a 1 8 scale black powder cannon, and then being immediately asked to captain a 155mm artillery piece. The principles are the same, but the applications are wildly different. But even still, a plane is a plane, and the principles of flight really don't change all that much. Now, the reason I decided to do some soul searching on why I disliked the idea of F-35, and I had to go back, way, way back. And I think it starts with world-class cockwombles like Robert McNamara. Just look at that smug prick. Don't you just want to slap the glasses off his face? Now, a very brief history lesson on this scummy excuse for a person. They were the CEO of the Ford Automotive Company. Some nipple dick in Washington decided that this prolapsed dick tip is the perfect secretary of defense. Under his tenure, he made a lot of sweeping decisions, such as drafting those who are mentally disadvantaged into the military. A program colloquially referred to as McNamara's Morons a phrase I will only use once during this video because what happened to those draftees was a crime and I personally think he should be held personally responsible and criminally charged for it because I think it makes him a war criminal, but that's just me. Now, the reason I'm going to point this out is not to kick a terrible human being when they're down, but to point out the level of general one-dimensional thinking that is all too common when a civilian who knows nothing of the military environment is really put in charge of it. No, I am not advocating for civilian relinquishment of the military. That is an extremely dangerous proposition that would always end in disaster. Instead, I want to illustrate how, in the past, neither side was willing to give ground on projects and each branch's own interest usually took precedence. But I think the part that really hung him out for me was the F-111 Aardvark program, which was initially supposed to be a multi-role fighter and sea fighter, but this next part may be a real misrepresentation of his opinion on the issue. But Robert McFucknuts felt that because of his time in production line management, all facets of the military can and should function like that. He's kind of right, but also very wrong. He felt the Navy was being whiny about the program when it turned out that it couldn't do any of the things that a carrier-born fighter needs to be able to do. The Navy knew this very well at the time, that there was a very stark difference between building of a carrier fighter and a ground-based strike fighter bomber. McNamara was eventually told to pound sand by the Navy, took what it could salvage from the F-111 program, and folded it into the F-14 program. 
both are still very, very capable aircraft for what they were designed for, and they performed the rules spectacularly, not casting any dispersions on it. Even the F-111 outlasted the F-14 in service in time with the American military. So again, I don't want to cast dispersion on the aircraft, only the bureaucracy surrounding their procurement and design. I suppose what I'm trying to say in as few tangents as possible, and failing spectacularly, is the prevailing attitudes in the past where you couldn't get one machine to do it all. You had to specialize to a large degree. A tank wasn't an IFV, an IFV wasn't a recon vehicle, so on and so forth. This attitude was pervasive even during my time in the service at the beginning of the millennium. I joined at a time when Canada was phasing out its Leopard tanks to replace them with the mobile gun system. Fortunately for the Canadian Army, combat in Afghanistan quickly dissuaded them of this notion of sticking with upgunned light armor. But the attitude of the brass at the time was needing of that holy grail of modularity, cheaper, lighter, disposable. <sighs> modularity, there's a buzzword that most of us on the ground hate. Let me explain. When a soldier hears modularity, they think of heavy add-ons that some poindexter in R&D never bothered to field test properly. I will put a few examples up here on the screen, like US body armor, Picatinny everything for the M4, and the Molly system. Things that on their own are fantastic and great, but when taken to the extremes that military procurement tends to do, it becomes a logistical burden. It wasn't until the advances in miniaturization made it possible for stuff like this and ever increasingly advanced technology lighter and more rugged to withstand the rigors of your average soldier is going to be putting it through, which is to say a lot. Segwaying back into why I had such a hate on for the F-35 is partially my own experiences in the military, lots of bad information, and as painful it is for me to admit, my own rose-colored nostalgia of legacy aircraft. Maybe it was Hollywood movies, maybe it was the plethora of fighter sims I played, or they deployed at a time when A-10s, Kiowas, Apaches were our close air support. I was always told and informed that close air support moved slow and to put warheads on foreheads. So when we learned that the A-10, etc. was going to be superseded by the F-35 in a ground attack role, you had to admit we were a little incredulous that the US would employ its latest 5th generation fighter in really such a mundane role. It's absurdly small payload capacity in comparison to other dedicated aircraft, Plus, we would hear constantly at the old rumor mill about this issue and that issue. And being 100% honest, it really didn't bother to verify it at the time. Every media outlet generally reported the same thing. There were endless delays, hardware compatibility issues, etc. and so forth. To credit LaserPig, I was completely unaware that all the misinformation and propaganda surrounding the F-35 came from a small group of agitators calling itself the Fighter Mafia. To those who are unaware of who they are, I'll paraphrase Mr. Laserpig. The Fighter Mafia is a collection of dinosaurs who parlayed passing or the most minor participation in DoD aircraft projects as themselves the sole reason certain fighters exist. They use this clout to propagandize our rivals on their media, claiming DoD was pissing away good money after bad chasing a lemon, while waxing nostalgic about a time that no longer exists in air warfare. I doubt Laserpig will ever see this, but I really hope I didn't do him injustice on that. Uh, but what he means by propagandizing everyone with this misinformation is they more or less hope to keep themselves relevant and browbeat DOD into scrapping the whole program and building aircraft for a type of war that's never going to happen again. The F-35, despite the teething pains any new aircraft goes through, is designed for the next type of war we may have to fight. Smaller, lighter, and just as stealthy and as nimble as the F-22. It's not going to pack the weapons load out, but the technology's reached a point where a universal chassis and true interoperability could actually work. And thus far, it has. Aside from minor equipment issues, which are generally dealt with in a very expedient manner, even for the military, because the last thing anyone wants to explain to the Joint Chiefs is why their expensive fleet of shiny new fighters are constantly being grounded. Now, here's the thing. Parts of fleets being grounded is not an uncommon occurrence for any Air Force. Anytime there's a training or operational incident, a block of a fleet may be grounded to ensure it isn't an endemic issue with maintenance or equipment, or if it's just pilot error. Of course, the media and detractors will latch onto this as absolute proof of the failure of the military industrial complex. Government is pissing away our money on trillion dollar boondoggles. Let's face it, the media loves to sensationalize anything when it comes to military spending. This fighter could have come in under budget early and shat sparkle bitch rainbows out of its backside at Mach 2 
while killing terrorists an entire world away and someone would still complain about this thing saying it isn't enough even a year ago i might have been one of those people it's a tough pill to swallow but personal growth that's important right but the switch from fighting insurgencies to moving back to near peer or even peer on peer fighting requires something called overmatch but ryan mcbeth i believe described it best the ability for one system to have a decisive advantage over another some guy in a bathrobe Unfortunately, with the proliferation of sophisticated anti-air defenses and early denial systems by our adversaries, the A-10 and F-15, as awesome as they were, and still are, would be sitting a ducks against SAMs and man pads used by any competent adversary. So the F-35 is the next obvious evolution. It's expensive and complicated, but it can do the job and do it exceptionally well, while offering the very expensive and irreplaceable pilot the maximum chance for success. The days of close-in dogfights are long past, or even slow and slow gun runs, relegated to Hollywood blockbusters. Most air-to-air -air battles are now going to take place without the pilots even seeing each other, and whoever's got the stealthiest airframe and best sensors is usually going to come out on top. The same is quickly becoming true of fixed-wing close-air support as well. Precision smart weapons that can be guided in miles and miles away into a target about a meter wide are negating the need for low and slow gun runs while drastically reducing the potential for collateral damage or blue-on-blue -blue incidents, especially in a war where electronic warfare is going to be king. For those who aren't aware, blue-on-blue -blue is where friendly fire is taking place and someone is hurt. However, I've probably waxed idiotic long enough about how I was wrong. The thing of it is, I don't expect to change your mind outright. If you want to hate on the F-35, you're welcome to do it. But I do believe time will prove you wrong. I've decided for myself when and how I'd change my own mind, and I expect everyone watching this to be adult enough to do the same. But hey, if you like my video, feel free to drop me a like, maybe a sub down below, and leave me a comment. I do try to read them all. I may not have time to respond, but I do see them. Anyways, guys, I will see you all in the next one.